Hello, students of Johnson University's uh, The Fundamentals of the Christian Faith and uh, CMMN5160, which is, it really needs to have the actual name changed of it. But anyway, uh, I am, as always, your lecturer, Dr. David Russell Mosley. Uh, so, I wanted to go ahead and make this. It's Monday. I'm going to go ahead and post this to Unit 3, and I'll just make sure you guys know that it's up. Um, but I wanted to go ahead and post this response to Unit 2. I'm, I'm all caught up now. <laughs> Um, I've read all your papers, forum posts, really interesting stuff coming out um, in your papers and in your conversations. So a few things that I, there are several things I wanted to discuss uh, fairly briefly. Um, the first couple come from your uh, forum and then the rest come from your reflection papers. So two things that came from your forums that I want to talk about, your forum posts that I want to talk about are one, why the genders in Francis's poem and uh, why why is physical death listed so a lot of you were curious about the genders why is it you know sister moon mother earth but you know brother fire or or whatever um the the really really simple mundane answer to that is that that's what gender those things are in those languages so basically in in italian so basically, uh, Francis wrote this poem in Italian. Italian is an inflected language like uh, Latin or Greek or Hebrew. Uh, what that means is um, various words have a gender. Uh, it's not, they're not man and woman. They're just, they're masculine or feminine or neuter. Neuter meaning uh, neither masculine nor feminine. Uh, and so when Francis writes this poem, he just uses the corresponding uh, sibling title for uh, the the object. So, you know, a uh, moon in Italian is probably la luna, or something along those lines. That's feminine. So it's sister moon, um, and so on and so forth. Now, there are actually deeper, really interesting questions here. One person brought up the possibility of uh, filled and unfilled, um, that perhaps Francis ordered things in such a way uh, to mimic Genesis. I haven't studied into that myself. I think that's really fascinating, and I'd love to see uh, some more work on that. Um, but then there's also just the question of why why were inflected languages gendered at all? Um, and what about English? And actually, Old English was an inflected language, and we still see aspects of that come through for the for instance the fact that we always call boats she right is uh actually indicative of the fact that um in some languages boat is actually feminine uh and so on um but anyway so that's the old like the the most mundane answer there is he assigns brother or sister depending on what gender it is in italian uh but there are potentially deeper more interesting things going on there okay so, uh, I had you all deal with the question of why is death included? I got some really good and interesting answers. Um, I think at the most fundamental, at the most basic, what's going on there is uh, Francis sees death as the next step um, in, our, in our pilgrimage to God. And it is only the next step. It's not the last step. Some of you kind of treated it as though, you know, death means the end going to be with God forever, never, never, amen, hallelujah. But it's not true. Scripture makes it pretty clear that death is not the last step. Uh, resurrection still has to come. We still have to be reunited with our bodies um, before we can fully enjoy uh, the beatific life, the, the, the vision of God. Um, and so I think Francis has death down as a natural event, which many of you uh, pointed to, one that started off as a punishment, but has now essentially been baptized by the death of Christ, the one who defeated death by death. Now, as Paul says, where death is thy victory, where death is thy sting, once death loses its sting, once it loses its um, ability to cause fear in us, because we know that it isn't the end, that there is still resurrection to come. Uh, we can we can treat death as a friend, as a sibling in creation, uh, one only necessary because of our fallenness, but nevertheless, um, our sister in creation. Okay, now then on to things from your um, 
discussion post, and I'm just going to pull something up on my computer real quick so I have it to reference. Uh, so one of the things that came up was uh, the question of... Not question. Uh, this is something that I encounter in, in all of my classes, including my class on the Trinity, which is always a little disheartening because I feel like I've done a relatively good job of hammering this home, and then I see it come up again and again and again. Um, and that is talking about God being in the Trinity, particularly being in three parts. Now, in this class, we didn't have time to really dig into uh, Trinitarian theology, but basically, it's always wrong. If you're following, you know, Orthodox, traditional, Trinitarian theology, it's always wrong to talk about God being in three parts. And the reason for that is uh, that if God is divisible into three parts, then we have to start asking questions. It really only leaves us two options. Either each of those parts is only 33% God, well, 33.333 repeating percent God, or each of those parts is a God on its own. So either, either we end up with each person of the Trinity not being fully God, or we end up uh, with three gods. Now, there's another thing playing in this uh, called divine simplicity, which we don't have time to get into, but if you take my Trinity class, then you'll learn about it there. Basically, divine simplicity is the doctrine that God is not complex. Now, it doesn't mean God isn't difficult to understand, but it means that God isn't, ma God isn't made up of many parts. Um, God doesn't have, like, arms, legs, hair, eyebrows, uh, that kind of thing. God is whole. And even though he is three, he is one, right? So each person, fully God, each, um, both individually and together, okay? And it's a paradox. It's something that we can't fully answer. Um, so there's that. Another thing that came up uh, in the papers was someone asked about Jesus being pre-existent. Now, and if Jesus is pre-existent, how can, like... How, how does that work? Um, and how can we say that God isn't human and that kind of stuff? Um, this is actually a really complicated question in some ways. A really simple answer, and one that we'll encounter in week four in this class, is essentially that, well, Jesus is not pre-existent. The Son is. So the person, you know, the human being, Jesus Christ, is made up of both... Uh, he is fully human, he's 100% human, and he's 100% God. And basically, so we can talk about the divinity having always existed. The divinity of Christ has always existed uh, because that's what makes him divine. Well, it's one of the things that makes him divine is being eternal. The humanity of Christ is something that exists in, uh, that began to exist at a particular time. You know, somewhere around, I think it's the 4th century BC technically because whoever kind of developed our, our calendar, our, our yearly calendar... Uh, was off between, I think, four to six years on the birth of Christ, probably. Anyway, but, the, but you know, the humanity of Christ had a particular beginning in time and in space, whereas the Son does not exist in time or space. He is the source of time and space. However, where it gets complicated is that because God is outside of time, God has foreknown for all eight, before all ages that the incarnation was going to be necessary. Um, and we'll get more into necessary how, and necessary for us, not necessary for him, but necessary for us. Uh, and we'll get into that a bit more in Unit 4, but basically because God has always known that, then humanity is always part of, and, and even God becoming man has always been within time, and even before time has always kind of been on God's mind. And so... It does get a little mixed up, um, a little confusing. But the really simple answer is to say, well, the humanity of Christ had a particular beginning, even though we can say it pre-existed in the, in the mind of God. Okay, I haven't totally confused you on that. Good, if I have, I'm sorry. Uh, now, someone had some questions about the fourth and fifth ways uh, in uh, Thomas's, Thomas Aquinas's five ways uh, of God's existence. And really, I want to talk about a few things here. So... First of all, I just want to reiterate that the five ways, um, or five proofs as they're sometimes called, were not intended to convince atheists that God existed. 
know that God exists. And it's really essential to understand. And this goes for all proofs of God's existence that uh, predate probably about the 18th century. Um, so it's Anselm, Aquinas, anybody like that. Because there were very few atheists during this time. Either either you lived in Europe and were a Christian, um, a Jew, or a Muslim, or you lived in the rest of the world and you were either probably a Muslim or uh, some version of paganism, um, whether that's Greco-Roman, whether that's uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, whatever. Uh, but you believed in some kind of supreme being. Um, so, you know... And and these these arguments assume certain things. They have certain givens, like the fact that it's impossible for necessary things to go on into infinity, or it is impossible for um, motion uh, to go on into infinity, right? To have an infinity of origins, because if there, as Aquinas says, if there are an infinity of origins, then there's no first one to start at all, which means there is no origin, which means there is no motion. And of course, we know that there's motion because we move. Okay, so that's that. But uh, someone did have a question about the fourth and fifth ways. So I just want to reread those really quickly and then talk about them. So, uh, and this is a slightly different translation because I pulled it up on my computer. The fourth way is taken from the gradation to be found in things. Among beings, there are some more and some less good, true, noble, and the like. But more and less are predicated on different things, according as they resemble in their different ways, something which is the maximum, as the thing is said to be hotter according as it is uh, more as it more nearly resembles that which is hottest. So that there is something which is truest, something best, something noblest, and consequently something which is uttermost being. For those things that are greatest in truth are greatest in being, as it is written in Metaphysics 2. That's by Aristotle. Now the maximum in any genus is the cause of all in that genus. As fire, which is the maximum heat, is the cause of all hot things. Therefore, there must also be something which is to all beings the cause of their being, goodness, and every other perfection, and this we call God. So basically, what Aquinas is saying here is, we look at an object, uh, we look, let's say, for instance, at an apple tree, and we declare it either a good apple tree or a bad apple tree, um, depending on how well it produces apples. But in that is is a standard notion of goodness. This is something for those of you who have already started reading uh, Lewis's Mere Christianity. You know, he talks about like the standard. Um, so people will say things like, "That's not fair." Like, oh, that guy cut me off in traffic. That's not fair. Well, where did you get your notion of fairness from? There's some pre-existing standard that you are utilizing when you're talking about everything else. And Aquinas basically says, so just as we do that, and just as we know that certain things have a source. Now, he uses fire here, and that's something that's probably a little bit more questionable with modern science. Nevertheless, um, Aquinas is basically saying, we know they're maximums, and they're the cause of these things. Therefore, if we think of goodness, truth, beauty, existence itself, there must be some maximum, some source for all of these things that allows us to talk about how there are good things and things that are less good. How there are things that exist and there are things that don't. Um, and he's basically saying, that's God. Okay, fifth way. Uh, is taken from the governance of the world. We see that things which lack intelligence, such as natural bodies, act for an end. And this is evident from their acting always or nearly always in the same way so as to obtain the best result. Hence it is plain that not fortuitously, but designedly, do they achieve their end. Now whatever lacks intelligence cannot move towards an end unless it is directed by some being endowed with knowledge and intelligence. As an arrow is shot to its mark by the archer, there, uh, therefore, some intelligent being exists by whom all natural things are directed to their end. And this being we call God. Uh, so this is the argument from final cause. Um, and that's bound up in, in Aristotelian understandings of causation. But basically, a final cause is, as Aquinas lays out here, the thing towards which something moves. Um, you know, acorns move toward becoming oak trees and then reproducing and making more acorns, which makes more oak trees. Uh, and basically he's saying that we see inanimate objects do this all the time. Things like, more or less, oak trees. Um, they just, they simply do this. 
Um, but because they don't have a will, because they don't have any intelligence, they can't choose to do this. So something must be making them do this. Now, this isn't an argument from like intelligent design. Aquinas isn't saying God makes every individual oak tree drop acorns, like directly. If, if God wasn't making the oak trees drop acorns at any given moment, they could stop. Like, that's not exactly what he means. What he means is that trees themselves have been so designed and are so guided by God and the angels that this is what they do. Uh, and if inanimate objects work this way, so must animate objects, so must we. There's got to be something directing us to our end, and that thing is God. And really, Aquinas is actually subtly making another argument, which is saying that God is that ultimate end toward which we're all moving. Okay, if you have any other questions about that, um, feel free to shoot those to me. Okay, last two things. Um, one thing that one question that was brought up uh, was based on a statement I made in one of the lectures, saying that God is still Creator without creation. Uh, and basically what I meant by that is there's a way in which God being creator is tied up in God being father. So there's a way in which we can say that by generating the sun and by spirating the spirit, um, God creates himself. That is, God moves within himself to make more God. He's done this eternally. This isn't, um, it isn't exactly self-creation, which is kind of another thing. But it's just simply this idea that the notion of creation itself is actually an overflow from the fatherhood of God, from the love of God, and from uh, the reason of God, that is, from the whole Trinity. All right, last thing that's come up in several papers was questions about, has God always existed? How do we know that? And what does it mean for God to be God? On the one hand, these are um, both simple and easy questions to answer. Uh, they're simple in the sense that, well, look at what Scripture actually says. Scripture, um, in many, you know, in the beginning, God uh, created the heavens and the earth. So we've got uh, Genesis 1 itself appears to say that God is pre-existent. That is, he exists before all things that are created, all things that are bound up by our notions of heaven and earth. And keep in mind that for, you know, the ancient Israelites for the early Christians, for the ancient church, for the medieval church, etc., 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 heaven didn't just mean the moon and the stars and the planets, uh, and as we now know, the other galaxies and so on. Heaven also meant the angels, um, the place that we kind of think of as heaven, that is, that place where we go to be with God. Um, that's a created place. And God is the source of those things. So clearly, God must be pre-existent. Um, and as Aquinas lays out in the five ways, he is in fact the source of existence. So a classical definition of God, this is a definition of God that would be assented to by a lot of philosophers like Plato and Aristotle. Um, it's one that would be accepted largely by Hindus ultimately by Muslims, by Jews, and by Christians, is that God is the existent thing. Well, not the thing, because thing implies space and time. God is the existent being. God is the only one who really has existence. The rest of us receive existence as a gift from God. And again, that goes the four ways, right? There must be some source of being. There must be some source of existence, and this we call God. Um, and again, scripture is replete with, with these references to God as being the source of all things, creator of all things visible and invisible, as it says in Colossians and in um, both the Apostles and Nicene Creed. So, um, so the answer is yes, God has always existed. How do we know that? Because that's what it means to be God. It's a little tautological, um, that is, it's repetitive, um, but that's also paradoxical. The, the definition of God means the source of all reality. Um, that's, the most, that's the most basic definition of God. Now, different traditions then expand that in different ways, right? Judaism has this kind of, and it, Islam both have this radical monotheism that Christianity doesn't have because we have the Trinity. Um, 
Hinduism is uh, yet different again because it we think of it as a polytheistic faith, but actually all of those gods are just expressions of the one true thing. Um, and and this is true uh, in in various different traditions. Um, but and it, but this is very important. The reason this is very important is because on the rare occasions that you encounter atheists who make arguments like, you know, do you believe in Thor? And you say no. And they say, well, I just believe in one God less than you. Like, I believe I, I disbelieve in one God more than you do. You know, you disbelieve in all these gods from pagan religions. Well, I disbelieve in all those gods. And I also disbelieve in your God. But that's making a category error. God is... God, in the Judeo-Christian sense, is not the same as Thor. And I don't mean, like, I don't just, I'm not making a value judgment there. That is, I'm not saying that the God of, of Christianity is better than Thor, which I do think. But that within their own systems, they're not the same kinds of things. In Norse mythology, Thor is a created being, right? He's born, <laughs> He, he has a source. He uh, exists within time and within space. Uh, it's the same with Zeus and the Greek uh, gods, or Jupiter, Jove, and, and the Roman gods. They exist within time and space. They are not uh, the source of all reality. Um, and, and Norse mythology and Greco-Roman mythology make that clear. There is a qualitative difference between them. And so whether or not Thor or Zeus or Aphrodite exists is completely unrelated to the question of whether the god of Christianity, of Judaism, of Islam, um, ultimately of Hinduism, exists. Those are two totally different questions. Uh, and it's really essential that we as Christians get that down. Because that really, I think, will help us um, in dialoguing with people that we encounter in our lives um, about why we believe in God, but not in, say, Thor or Zeus or something like that. Okay, um, thank you all for great papers. I look forward to seeing your stuff on um, evil and sin this week. It sounds awkward to say, but I do. I look forward to your forum posts and your reflection papers. Um, I do need to let you know that I won't be as available as usual Thursday and Friday this week. Uh, one of the schools that I work for is doing an overnight orientation um, at a camp, and so I won't be staying the night, but I still have to go there, uh, and I'll be there all day without uh, presumably internet access or anything like that. Um, I'll be home in the evenings, so I'll try and get everything done then. Uh, but just to let you know, I won't be as accessible Thursday and Friday this week uh, as I might normally be. Um, also, just a quick note on your reflection papers, do remember to cite your sources, um, and that's any time you reference them. So not just quotations, but any time you reference, whether it's one of my lectures, whether it's one of the books, do make sure that you cite that. And also make sure that you are uh, reflecting on all the various things that we've done as much as you can. You know, so I want to see if we read Heine, Cohn, and McGrath one week, I do want to see something from each of those. You can spend more time with others than some if, if there are aspects that have really drawn you in more. But this is part of how I'm checking to make sure you're doing the reading. So if you're not, if you don't mention Heine or Cohn in a reflection paper, I'm going to have to assume that you didn't read them. Okay? So anyway, just that little plug. Uh, God bless everybody, and I look forward to seeing you next time.